This car is so old-fashioned you'd expect it to be wearing a top hat, a monocle and complaining about letting women vote. Hi, I'm Simon and welcome to Mystery Machines. This is a 1954 MGTF, and so is that. It's a proper British sports car. Engine at the front, two seats, manual gearbox, open top, drive to the rear, lovely. It's the last in a long line of roadsters dating all the way back to the 30s that set the template for affordable sports cars right up to the modern day. The Mazda MX-5 Miata wouldn't exist if it wasn't for these plucky little Brits tearing up the roads 80 years ago. But there's a problem, and it started with World War II. See, the war had decimated the British economy, and the only way it was going to be revived was with home production and exports. Before the war, MG had built up a loyal following for its lightweight, fun, affordable sports cars in the home market. During the war, scores of US servicemen based in England also discovered the nimble little cars, which were a far cry from the big lumbering American cars that they were used to. At war's end, scores of MGs returned home with soldiers to the States. They were nothing like anything else on the roads at the time. With the war over, MG dusted off its pre-war blueprints and started building cars again. The first being the now legendary TC, an inexpensive, lightweight and most importantly, fun to drive roadster. In order for the company to survive in post-war England, exports were going to be essential and the TC fit the bill perfectly. While only 10,000 were ever built and only 2,000 ever made it to the US, the TC had a huge impact in the car culture at the time, spawning a whole generation of new car enthusiasts. In 1950, MG updated the TC and released the TD. It had uprated independent coil suspension, doing away with the leaf springs of the TC, a much more refined chassis, and it was just a generally more polished product. By 1953, when the model ended, almost 30,000 had been made, with all but 1,600 of them being exported around the world. By this time, MG had gathered a substantial following both in the UK and abroad, including here in Australia, and fans were excited for the next model. They were hoping for something sleek and modern, a sports car that could hang with the big boys like the Jaguar XK, Triumph TR3, and the just-released Austin Healey 100. Teaser pictures of the upcoming MG prototypes had already been published in popular car magazines at the time. The streamlined body of what would become the MGA had been tested on the EX175 Le Mans prototype car all the way back in 1951, so excitement for a new car was high. And what did they get instead? A slightly fatter TD with nicer headlights, an engine you couldn't reach, bucket seats, and wire wheels. Sure, it was a good little sports car, but only if your frame of reference was a car from 1935. With the TF, MG was resting entirely on its laurels. The car was a relic of a bygone era. In music terms, it's as if the Beatles spent months teasing the release of Sgt. Pepper's and then brought out a remastered version of Hard Day's Night. Yeah, it's nice, but it's not what the people wanted. The excuse given by British Leyland, the parent company of MG, was that they didn't want the new model to compete with the new Austin Healey 100, which was built in the same factory. MG fans, motoring journalists, and the public were suitably and understandably scathing. Sales plummeted, and even with the more powerful 1500 engine added later in the production run, sales remained poor, with less than 10,000 being produced. The TF was dropped only after 18 months, making way for the promised replacement, the legendary MGA. Critical history aside, the TF is a lovely little car. Look at that face, and that body. Curves everywhere. I love the design of the headlights. These side vents look like gills. The thin chrome bumpers and knock-on wire wheels set the whole design off perfectly. These two are mid-production 1954 models with the 1250 XPAG engine, 
an engine almost as ancient as the design itself. It's a 1.25 litre overhead valve pushrod design with twin SU carburetors putting out around 57 brake horsepower at about 5,500 RPM. That doesn't sound like much, but in a car that weighs just over 900 kilograms, it's actually not that bad. The engine's coupled to a 4-speed manual with synchro on 2nd, 3rd and 4th, and it's shifted with the smallest shift knob I've ever seen on a car. More on the gearbox later. The body is hand-built with steel panels over a wood frame. The floor is wood too. That's bolted to a ladder chassis that rides on coil springs at the front and leaf springs at the rear. The whole car in turn rides on these lovely 15-inch steel spoked rims with knock-on hubs. The cockpit is basic but functional. All the gauges are located in the centre of the car in these nifty octagonal clusters, reminding you exactly of what car you're driving. See? The badge is the same. It's a nice touch. You get oil pressure, water temperature, and amp information. A clock that doesn't work, a vague RPM gauge, and a slightly less vague speedometer in miles per hour. You get various switches for lights, choke, and starter. Corners over here under the cowling, indicators on a time switch. The doors open backwards. You get two glove boxes. The windscreen is completely flat and mounted on these cool brackets allowing you to fold it down. There's no heater or cooler. The steering wheel is massive and it can be difficult to get past when you're entering the car. The pedals are set close together, while the accelerator isn't really a pedal at all, but instead a sort of roller on a stick. The seats are comfortable, although completely unbolstered, and when released the car didn't come with seat belts. I think the general idea was don't crash. Behind the seats there is room for things, as well as the roof. On the back, there is a luggage rack and the spare wheel. Not much storage space for a long trip. The whole design is simple and uncluttered, a trait that all these old MG Roadsters share. So what's it like to drive? Surprisingly easy. The seats are soft and relatively supportive, the suspension sets up the bumps quite well, although you'll definitely notice some of the bigger ones. Steering is direct and very sensitive. This thing goes around corners like it's on rails, and not a whole lot of input is needed to put it where you want it. The huge wheel helps, although the narrow rim can get tiresome on your fingers. There's loads of feedback and you feel really connected to what the car is doing. There's no power steering, although you don't really need it. Even at low speeds, not a lot of force is needed to turn it. Where you really notice the TF's age is in the chassis. The whole car flexes and rolls around under you. It's got the structural rigidity of an old mattress. It leans into corners, it follows the camber of the road, it moves about. Push it too hard and it'll understeer and snap oversteer without warning. However, getting it up to speed to do either of those things is going to be a tall order because, by any stretch of the imagination, this car is slow. Zero to a hundred time is around 19 seconds on a good day, and top speed would almost be 130 if you fold down the windscreen. Hills can be a challenge too, so they are best attacked with vigour. The close set pedals are small and don't favour people with large feet. The clutch is pretty light, making shifting gears a pleasure. The gearbox really shows its age too, and you need to be paying attention to get a smooth shift. While not a tractor, there is nothing slick about this box. Third and fourth gear are very long, so even on the windiest of roads you won't be shifting an awful lot, and that's probably for the best. Brakes are drums all around and fade pretty quickly if under heavy use but are generally decent for a car of this age. The pedal feels heavy, but it's also a little spongy. There's no boosting on the brakes, so you've got to use a bit of force. That's all part of the experience, though. These cars are just a joy to drive up a hilly back road. You can really chuck them into corners and get them to sing if you time your shifts right. The steering is so direct, you just think where you want the car on the road, and it'll go there. Back off the throttle and the exhaust pops and fizzes like a proper sports car should. And the sound, oh the sound, it's glorious. You feel like you're going awfully fast and then you look down and you realise that you're barely doing 80. The chassis wobbles and moves around, the body shakes, there are rattles everywhere, the wind is blasting you from every side and you're cold and hot at the same time. Modern cars just cannot compete with the 1930s driving experience you'll get with one of these little British sweethearts. You'll get plenty of attention too. A modern sports car cannot even hope to turn as many heads as a classic MG. 
Pull up anywhere and within five minutes you'll be caught up in conversations about the car, having photos taken and offering to take people for a ride. This is not the car for shy people. However, if you're thinking of getting into classic cars and want to have something a bit out of the ordinary, give an MGTF a go. It's more than a warmed over 30s relic. It's a living, breathing celebration of a fascinating time in motoring history. And that's what classic cars are all about.